Sveiki, mėly laisvės televizijos žiūrovai. Šiandien specialioje laidoje mes turime ypatingą svečią. Žmogus, kuris dešimt metų valdė kaiminę šalį Estiją. Tomas Henrik Ilves, žmogus pavertęs valstybę viena iš lyderių kibernetinio saugumo ir apskritai skaitmeninių paslaugų srityje. Šiuo metu jisai gyvena Kalifornijoje ir dėsto Stanfordo universitete kaip kviestinis profesionalas. Gimęs Švedijoje augės JAF, baigęs Kolumbijos ir Pensilvanijos universitetus psichologiją. Be gimtosiose stu moka anglų, vokiečių, latvių ir ispanų kalbas. Let me start with this historic event of 30 years ago, the Baltic Way. And since then the world was looking at Baltics as one as such. But for you who knows things from inside, what are the greatest differences? Size. Uh, I mean, basically the choices that different countries have made as to what, they're, what they consider important. And, um, uh, but I really can't uh, pull one out from the other, I would say. It's just that uh, sort of self-identification is different in the different countries. And clearly in the case of Lithuania, especially from the sort of the decision of your new president-elect to visit Poland first, that there is that historical tie with Poland that uh, Estonia really hasn't had since the uh, 16th century, mm. uh, whereas Estonia is because already linguistically it's very close to Finland. I mean, it's uh, Finnish and Estonian are very, very close, and Finland has had a huge influence on uh, on Estonia in the last 30, 35, 40 years, simply because Estonians could watch Finnish television. One thing that stands out that everybody who looks at Estonia these days, uh, they know that E is like for electronics or whatever is do with IT. But uh, let us go back to uh, 2007, uh, half of a year when you started the office, and uh, uh, let us remind this uh, thing that was called the Bronze Night and how it affected later uh, development in the country? Well, uh, I mean, we, it was clear that um, there was a statue in the middle of the city that was being used for provocations, had been used for provocations. It was a statue, a Soviet statue, like, you know, you've had all over the Soviet Union and uh, basically because over the years it had been become a bigger and bigger provocation because every year on the 9th of May, people would gather there, larger and larger crowds, drinking, kind of waving Soviet Union flags, uh, you know, kind of the Dysantniki would come out and be obnoxious. And so the government uh, decided that they would move it. This was not to take it down, but to do as with there's right with a memorial to put it into a military cemetery. But as we know, uh, the, uh, with, uh, with considerable efforts on the part of the Russian embassy and some GRU people there, it was fom uh, they turned into a riot. Uh, but it was a large, I mean, it was a control, it was a deliberately manufactured and uh, riot that had you know, people from with their mobile phones directing crowds. I mean, it was clearly not a spontaneous That's event. Right. But what followed was DDO's attack, right? right. Well, and it, that was interesting uh, new story. Well, a DDoS attack, which stands for Distributed Denial of Service, is when you, you attack servers with massive amounts of pings to the point that they become overloaded and the server stops functioning. And so what we saw was that um, you know, basically government offices, banks, newspapers, they were, all their servers were shut down. Uh, historically, basically every, every uh, book that is being written or that will be written in the future uh, about cyber war begins with Estonia. Because before that, you had cyber attacks, but it was never for a political end. So, you know, the. Against the country as such. Against, yes. For, I mean, you know, von Clausewitz, the German military theoretician or strategy theoretician, defined war as the continuation of policy by other means. 
Um, and this was clearly a case of the continuation of policy by other means. That's right. But instead of a military attack, you shut down a country's servers. The interesting thing about it, of course, aside from the fact that this was the first time this happened, and it happened, has happened many times since, it was used extensively in the Georgian-Russia war, but the first time it happened, no one believed us, almost no one. I mean, we went to NATO, we we're all NATO allies, Lithuania, Estonia, and the Western countries, with basically the exception of the United States, that is, uh, that... Uh, with far more sophisticated understanding of things. Oh, come on. This is, what are you talking about? You're Paranoid. Just, you're, you're a typical Balt, you know? <laughs> you're, you're making this up and you're blaming Russia, you know? And, uh, of course, the U.S. almost immediately sent a team to <laughs> investigate because this was obvious. They understood what was going on. Um, but, uh, yeah, let's put it this way, that if you... you you faced a lot of ignorance in uh, the North Atlantic Council, which is the governing body of NATO, and plus a, a bias, let's face it, I mean. But if you look from his history perspective from these days, <clears throat> this event ultimately led into what Estonia is now, and uh, also this uh, uh, NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense uh, uh, Center of Excellence was created. Well, well, I would say yes, that came out of that, but Estonia did what, I mean, became what it was, is today, beginning much, much, much earlier. In fact, that was one reason why I okay. am convinced they attacked us, because already then, the level of digital development there was so high that, um, uh, that um, it, this was a kind of a psychological attack as well, uh, okay. because to show that it's vulnerable. The important thing other, also mm -hmm. to notice, because I'm always asked this, is that Never did the attack get into anything, especially the, and particularly the government-based system that we had built <clears throat> that was introduced in 2001. It was never breached. You can, you can block access, but you cannot get in. And that's the important part. Yes. And then there was the year 2008, and you went to Moscow, and then you met this uh, President Medvedev. Uh, what uh, conclusions did you draw from that meeting that you maybe didn't know before, or why did you go there? Well, I've gone to Russia many times, and uh, that was just like every other time where you can have a discussion, and then afterwards they say you talked about something else. <laughs> I mean, that's, okay. I mean, that's, what, uh, that's what I was used to. I mean, it, it didn't matter. Be it with the, as a foreign minister meeting with Primakov, or as a president meeting with Medvedev, you know, you can have a, you can actually have an okay discussion, but then what follows that has nothing to do with what you discussed. Many, many people use a, a, a thing called Skype, and uh, not many of them maybe know that uh, it was usually created by people in Estonia. How this project evolved evolved in Estonia, and what's the you know outcome to to the programmers? Well. First of all, I mean, the, the people, there, there were a Swedish and a Danish investor who were looking for someone to develop this project or this product. And there were four guys in Estonia who had, um, A, developed something that was the precursor to Skype, which was uh, Kazaa, Kaza, mm -hmm. which was a file sw swapping program. Music but, maybe. Right, but if, I mean, if you're already swapping files of music recordings, it's a short step to get to voice over internet, pro, the voice over internet protocol. Um, and the little backstory to that is that uh, the Kaza guys uh, barely escaped US prison because uh, you know, they, the company Kaza was attacked for, for uh, intellectual property ownership violations. But anyway, they got out of that, then they created, they did all the work for Skype, and then, uh, well, the importance was, I think, uh, most importantly, rather than the fact that some four guys got really rich, was that it changed people's understanding of Estonia and its possibilities, especially among young people, because the usual attitude, which we've had in all of this region, Oh, we're here on the outskirts of Europe. Oh, it's cold, it's rainy. You know, real life is in London or Paris or Berlin, blah, 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 blah. 
Suddenly, these four guys invent a product that within months becomes a worldwide brand. And suddenly, people said, oh, well, maybe I should study math. Maybe that's a good idea. Uh, and so we saw this huge increase in interest in actually doing things in IT in Estonia. So it had a, I mean, sort of this, that I think was the major effect sociologically. The fact that it was a unicorn, okay, that was nice, but uh, it really, the, the domestic influence, I think, uh, is, was immense. You have this interesting hashtag called uh, Estonia Mafia. Yeah. What is that? Can you explain? Uh, it's <laughs> it's all the people who uh, uh, all the people who um, are involved in tech who are Estonians and we're all over the world. So uh, so that's how they communicate. Yeah. I remember I had one case where someone, a woman, a Chinese woman, a Canadian Chinese woman wrote, I'm in Dubai. I need a, a chip card reader. Are there any Estonians here? Um, well, since I had many more followers on Twitter than she did, I said, by the way, Estonian mafia. And then three hours later, she goes, thank you. I got my card reader. <laughs> so, uh, But it, I mean, it's interesting because uh, while you may have all of this intense competition between little companies in Estonia. When it comes to IT, because everyone's doing something different, there's a lot of cooperation because no one's doing exactly the same thing. And so, um, so if you're working on a problem, I mean, you know, well, I don't know how to solve this, you'll go ask you know, someone else from the Estonian mafia if they've come up with this. So it's actually, it's odd for, a, for a people that rarely cooperate right. <laughs> domestically, uh, it, is a for, it is a place where actually there's a huge amount of cooperation. And it looks like uh, cooperation with Finland was very important. And now you are the first and only probably countries which have this uh, cross-border data exchange system which allows you to you know, use uh, your uh, benefits as a one system user, right? Can it expand into Baltics? Uh, well, EU? first of all, mm. it works in one direction. That is, if you come, because Estonia provides these services, they don't. So if, no. you, if, you wanna, if, you wanna, if you're a Finn and you come to Estonia, um, you, will, uh, you can get a prescrip your prescription from home. It doesn't work the other way. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, there's the ADOS directive of the EU that says that all countries must provide a, a digital identity, which is not done by all countries yet. Uh, and B, you must offer to other EU citizens the same services that you offer to your own country. Since we offer basically all services <laughs> online, in fact, there are only three, three transactions with the government you cannot do online. One is getting married, you have to show up. Two is getting divorced, you both have to show up. And three, which is also very important, especially looking at the United States and London, you cannot have anonymous shell companies buying property, you must, a member of the board, if you're a company that is buying property, a member of the board must show up. Hmm. Everything else you can do online. Now, other countries have some of those services, but um, if you come to Estonia, you can get all the services that Estonians have by this rule. Um, so, and that even that took a long time to get in place because I proposed this to the Finnish president seven years ago and it took all this time to get it in place and the technological part would have taken at most three weeks but the legal and policy and regulatory mm. aspects of it took seven years. Same with this uh, online voting already 10 years at least right you have? 14. 14, sorry. So uh, why do you think not many of any at all uh, nations followed that path? I, w I would advise them not to unless they have the environment that we have. Because basically what you're doing is you're using a system that we use every day for banking, for pharmacies, I mean for prescriptions, for medical records. All of that is up and running. And so voting is something you do every two years using the same system. So there's a lot of trust. Whereas the problem with electronic voting in most countries is that they have a strictly standalone system 
that they use for voting and those are not very sound up to now. Whereas since we know that since no one has lost any money in, from, in the bank because of this, this, through this system, then we trust it for voting as well. And no one's medical records have been stolen or anything. Right. So it's a, it's a very different approach. And so the reason why countries have not adopted it I think is wise because they're not willing to take the real step, which is to digitize the whole society. Well, strangely enough, uh, uh, this is also connected with a higher turnout, but it looks like it's not connected. And if you look at the results of European Parliament elections a couple of weeks ago, Lithuania much higher with this analog voting than Estonia. Probably this does not make people more active anyway. Well, yeah, I think that the... Um, I mean, in the case of the parliamentary election, it probably did make a difference mm. because we had uh, was forty-seven percent of votes were online. I see. Out of the whole total, um, I think it has more to do with the European Parliament elections not being very much on the radar screen in Estonia this year. Also, because uh, they just had an election, so people are like, "Oh God, I got to go vote again." <laughs> Right. Uh, President Kalulait met with President Putin. Uh, do you see any reasons behind of this move and any uh, mm, benefits for Estonia? Well, so far not yet, but I think it's always useful to attempt to talk to Russia. I'm not sure what you will get out of it, but nonetheless, yes. We will see. All presidents have gone to Russia, more or less. All presidents have gone to Russia. Uh, and it really, so far... It hasn't been of much use. Use or what? Okay, let's talk about a bit of domestics because in Lithuania we know about ECRE and uh, even its minister, IT uh, minister, who was forced to step down uh, because of those domestic violence accusations. Do you think it's like a, a Estonia is taking a pause from very intense time and maybe something is slowing down? Don't you have this feeling? It may. Well, I mean, basically, uh, if the, the outgoing prime minister wanted to do everything possible not to lose his position as prime minister, so we ended up with this uh, odd coalition that has done incredible damage to the reputation of the country. I mean, yeah, I was just thinking the only major newspaper that has not written about it was until today the Economist, and so The Economist also has a piece on them. Uh, so I, I'm actually quite concerned about that. Mm. Uh, let's talk about books, because reading in public is becoming a rare sighting and uh, amounts of information which is bombarding our eyes is growing. Uh, what's about your reading habits? Did it change since uh, those times when we started reading digital? What are your favorite authors lately and topics that you read? Well. Um, well, I mean, I, as soon as I started getting into, uh, into Estonia, well, into politics, I basically all the literature part sort of fell off. And even though I was, that was my main interest in, when I was younger, uh, and these days what I read is almost completely tied to either democracy or the digital era and is part of my research. Uh, because uh, I'm actually quite concerned about the future of democracy uh, with the kinds of uh, efforts that we've seen in the past 10 years. Uh, basically, once, you know, once two things happened, one was Facebook came out, and then the, uh, the smartphone. Before that, there was no worldwide kind of the massive way of co communicating. I mean, for two reasons. One was that people, most people didn't have access to the internet. Um, it really has been enabled by mobile devices. Uh, with four, 3 and 4G, people all over the world now can access the internet. And secondly, of course, Facebook, which for many, for million, billions of people, people think, actually think the internet is Facebook. But Facebook became this method of communication. And that has been a place to spread disinformation in ways that has, was never possible before. 
You know, in the old days, you might have some crazy kook somewhere that was either a Nazi or a communist or something. It didn't matter. You know, they would just sit there. But now they find their own communities. They find them across the United States, across Europe. Uh, and, and then, of course, the, uh, the big step, I would say, would be the discovery on the part of... Uh, Russia and later Iran and other countries that you can um, distribute a massive amount of disinformation right. via the internet. And now you live, uh, well, you reside in Stanford, which is uh, closely related with Facebook. Uh, your findings and uh, any discoveries, or do you miss anything from Estonia at the time? Oh, being? I miss very much in Estonia. In fact, it's. Uh, there are a bunch of Estonians who are all involved in tech and, and they all live in, the, in Silicon Valley and we get together every couple of weeks and um, we, always, we always end up discussing something new and stupid that we have discovered because actually it's a huge paradox. I mean, where I live or where I work in a 12-kilometer radius are the headquarters of Tesla, Apple, Google, Facebook, Palantir and a whole bunch of other, you know, just under a billion dollar valuation companies. Yet it, everything, if it's the public sector, it runs like the 1950s. You know, you have to take, a, you have to take your electricity bill to prove, to register your child in school. If you want to get a driver's license, you can spend a day or two standing in line just to... To, uh, to start. You know. What does it mean? This is like elite is separating itself from the masses or masses don't understand? No, it's happening. more that there is no investment on the part of any level of government in the United States in effective digital, uh, digital services. Uh, none. There is none. I mean, it's not done. Um, I, mean, part of it is under, I mean, part of it comes with the fact that uh, the they refuse to have the most elementary and essential aspect of digital governance, which is providing a secure digital identity. And they don't, if you're not going to do that, you're not going to have digital governance. Well, it looks like this administration is uh, getting involved in digital world. And I will ask you directly, do you think uh, Huawei is a pure evil or uh, not exactly that, that we are seeing the news? Is it dangerous to democracy? Well, I don't know if it's dangerous to democracy, but certainly they've had a pretty bad track record on, uh, on certain things regarding security. And so um, I'm not sure whether, this, whether tariffs of the, of the level that they're imposing is the right solution, but certainly it's an issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, 5G... The only other real producers of 5G are uh, Nokia and Ericsson, but they're, they're far more expensive. They don't get state subsidies. I mean, Huawei is, you know, is a massively subsidized by the government, so it's, um, that's fairly tricky in the, in the EU to, to compete with them. Uh, when you look at those things that are happening in the world, like changing every half of the year, uh, what do you anticipate in the future next big thing in technology? Because they're talking about artificial intelligence, nanotechnologies, 5G, self-driving cars, or everything will come in one big leap. You know, it is basically impossible to predict. No one, <clears throat> you know, Facebook was invented in 2003. Um, no one in 2003 would have predicted its role, massive, completely dominant role uh, in the world today. It was, it's not possible to do that. Uh, so I, do, I stay away from predictions. I do think that yeah, we will continue to see uh, newer and, f and better and faster uh, things in IT, especially with 5G, but to say what will be the next thing, I won't. I won't do it simply because you'll end up being stupid. And uh, we have questions from our uh, viewers. Uh, they ask the bow tie, stylish costumes, passionate speeches at massive gatherings or concerts. How much this personal image is important for you? Is anybody creating it, or it's your own uh, part of your personality? 
I've worn bow ties for basically since my father died because he wore bow ties. Hmm. So I started wearing a bow tie just kind of like out of respect. And uh, I don't know. I don't know about my image. I don't know anything else. I mean, I give speeches that I write. Uh, Yourself? So, yeah. I don't have... I don't have speech writers, never have. So uh, I'm passionate about what I write about or I don't give those speeches. <laughs> and how much English was important for you as a president when you traveled and did you use it not just for official meetings, did you use also behind the scenes? Would you have been able to do the same things without speaking fluently this language? Well, in fact, behind the scenes is much more important because when you have an official meeting, you can have a translator, right? But, um, but, if, uh, but in actually having serious discussions outside the official meeting room, that's where it certainly comes in handy. <laughs> a second question that's like repeats a bit of what we talked in the beginning, but Lithuania tends to compare itself to Estonia and admit that we are lagging behind. Do you agree with that comparison? That... Well, no, I would never say one country lags behind. I would say when it comes to digitization, there are certain steps that I think Lithuania needs to take in order to move to the front line of European states on this air, in, this, in this one realm. Uh, but otherwise, I wouldn't say, I mean, I would never say that Lithuania lags behind. And in fact, you know, economically, it's doing fantastically. It's got a booming uh, software industry and so forth, so I, not just speaking about Lithuania, but what are the main obstacles in uh, society and its leadership that holding off the country becoming more integrated into this online uh, service thing? Well, simple. You need a you need a you need a secure digital identity with legal f efficacy, meaning that you can sign documents with it with this thing that allows you to do all the things that you can do. You need a good architecture that allows you to, uh, that sec allows you to securely access your information uh, and prevents others from accessing that information, more importantly. And third, which is going to be uh, more and more of a problem, is you have to worry about data integrity. And this is something that I think people need to think about more, by which I mean that Everyone's worried about privacy, and I, I agree privacy is important, but privacy is not the real issue. Privacy is if someone publishes my blood type or someone publishes my bank account, they violated my privacy. However, if someone changes the record of my blood type or if someone changes my bank account, then not for the better, uh, that is a real problem, and that's integrity. You have to worry about data being changed by other people uh, without your permission. And uh, if, you, if you realize that those are the three fundamental problems that need to be solved, and they largely are not, they are not technical problems, they're legal and policy problems. If you have the right laws, you have the right policy, you have the right, and you have the right regulation, all of this becomes easy. Technology or anything that we have, sort of technological advancement of the kind that you see in Estonia has nothing to do with money. Nothing. Because especially now, it's, everything is so much cheaper than it was in 2001 because of Moore's Law. It's just everything is cheaper in technology. Everything else is more expensive, but technology is only right. cheaper. So you solve those, you, you, know, you just do it your own way. That you don't have to do what the Estonians sure. do. Another question, which is a popular topic in Lithuania, do you see Russia is, is still a threat to uh, Estonia? Well, I mean, I, I think it's, given its behavior in, in democratic elections in the past two, three years, uh, then, um, and given that it was disrupting countries far away from it, not its neighbor like Ukraine, that it's a threat to basically the, the liberal democratic world. Okay, and some strange questions, but they must be asked. Uh, why there are so many speed radars near Narva? Are there? 
you probably don't know about. I it. really <laughs> don't know. But I would say one of the things that is important is that um, uh, we have virtually no corruption in the in, among traffic cops because basically it's all computerized. So uh, and now I don't know if there's so many in Narva as opposed to the rest of Estonia. There are a lot on Estonian roads. I mean, the big roads, are a lot of them. Uh, all the way from Tallinn to Narva, all the way from Tallinn to Pärnu and to Tartu. Mm. It's like every couple of kilometers there's another camera. Okay, and then uh, which one of Tallinn tastes best to your Wait. idea? There are s obviously certain uh, Vanna Tallinn brands. Oh, I don't drink, You, you I don't, don't drink that Vanna Tallinn, so we should ask somebody else about that. Uh, uh, and how much important was the help to uh, Estonia, uh, the Finland? How much was it involved economically and probably intellectually in your development early years we are talking? I think it was huge. I mean, not so much economically, but rather the mindset. Oh, one important thing, language uh, knowledge. I mean, Estonia had before everyone else, a, huge, a very high level of English language knowledge simply because Estonians would watch bad American TV, like Dallas and Dynasty, Dynasty and Knight Rider on Finnish television with subtitles, but they were speaking in English. So people heard, I mean, okay, people in Northern Estonia, they understand Finnish from reading it, but they hear the language, so you had this that was a huge effect. And then, of course, uh, you know, the amount of tourism that we got for, because for, to buy cheap alcohol brought a lot of money into Estonia. Um, you know, politically, Finland was not a big supporter of, uh, of uh, independence for any of us. In fact, the Finnish president was not, uh, at the time, Mauno Koivisto was not at all sure about Estonian independence and uh, the public statements of people like President Tarja Halonen and Foreign Minister Erki Tome were hardly, I mean, hardly p polite. In fact, they were sort of, no, if you, if anyone were to say, any of us were, were to say something like, you know, describing the psychological problems of an entire nation, uh, well, that would be a scandal, but anyway, so the, politically, not so much. Economically, a fair bit of investment in smaller companies, and, uh, but psychologically, from the point of view of uh, having access to Western uh, television was very important. Okay, and lastly, how do you see the future of Baltics in the EU as such project continues to evolve despite all those challenges that we're seeing lately? Well, it's uh, really a matter of effort. Uh, you know, I know from our own, our own presidency, it was extremely effective, even though it's a very, very small country uh, in, by EU standards. Um, because if you, uh, if, you, if you know your goals and you work on those goals and are high, very prepared, you can get a lot done in the EU. Uh, you know, and then there's some other presidency, presidencies uh, further from this part of the world where even though the countries may be big, they aren't very effective. Um, I think one problem is that a natural ally with the Baltic countries and the Nordic countries uh, during our time in the EU for the past 15 years has been the UK. And the UK leaving... Uh, as a big, big, big country in the EU, uh, considerably reduces the influence that you know Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, as kind of a like-minded group, will have in the EU, and that's something that uh, why I regret very much the departure of the UK. Which might happen, which might not. We will see in short future. Okay, Mr. President, thank you for coming today. Uh, Emily Žiūrovai, pas mūsų viešėjo buvęs Estijos prezidentas Tomas Henrik Ilves. Mes kalbėjomės apie daugybę dalykų, kurie yra susiję su Estijos proveržiu. Tikėsikimės jūsų dėmesio ateityje. Ačiū Jums už dėmesį, ačiū Jums už klausimus, kuriuos atsiuntite šiai laidai. Iki kitų, iki penčių susitikimų.